Okay. <clears throat> Tonight, we go into the third part of looking at how to pray according to God's will. Uh, <clears throat> when we think of prayer, we most often think of the words. If I tell somebody, you know, say a prayer, they start thinking of what are the words I'm going to say. We actually teach our children to say specific words, and the interesting thing is, we teach them to say words as a prayer that they don't even understand. One of the first prayers most little kids are taught in a Christian home is, thank you God for the food. Now think about that for a minute. They're too young to really understand what thank you means. Even adults have a hard time trying to comprehend what God really covers. The only word in that sentence they understand is food. But we still teach them to say it. Why? Because we know they're going to grow up, and we hope as they grow up, they will begin to understand what the meanings of those words are, and they'll have an attitude that goes with that when they pray. And that's what we want to look at tonight, because it is the attitude that makes the prayer. The attitude makes the prayer. And Jesus helped us understand that in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, when you pray, uh, do not be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who's unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And notice this last sentence, because here's where it says to us that the validity of the prayer is established by the attitude behind the prayer. When you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans because they think they'll be heard because of their many words. What's Jesus saying there? Words don't make the prayer. Now you have to use words to pray. But just using the words doesn't make the prayer. And we can understand this a little better today, perhaps, than, for example, when I was young growing up, because we didn't have this illustration back then. But now with our TVs and being able to see all around the world and so on and so forth, uh, we've seen Muslims who just repeat words after words after words after words. And I'm certainly not questioning their sincerity, but that's exactly what Jesus was talking about. Learning prayers and just saying them over, <laughs> over and over and over again. Now, you might say, well, why are you making such a big deal about that? Because frankly, we also have that problem and, and maybe don't even realize it. How many times have you ever heard somebody say, if they were called upon to prayer, uh, to pray, or would give this out as sort of a warning, don't ask me to pray, they'd say, I don't know what to say. Well, that's saying the words are vitally important. And they're not. <laughs> it's the thought, the attitude, the meaning behind it. Prayer is not a matter of saying the right words. Then there's the opposite extreme in which you think maybe there are some people who think the more words you use, the better the prayer. <laughs> Have you ever heard anybody like that? <laughs> that used to be a real big thing. I, fortunately, now I, in traveling around, I've seen in different churches all the time, uh, I, m men are taking the, the preparation of the communion meditation a little more seriously and, th than maybe they did when I was growing up. Because I remember, and my dad had a phrase for it, uh, of, of at the time of communion, guys would give a prayer, and he called it praying around the world. Because they didn't pray about the Lord's table. They prayed for every missionary the church supported and whatever was going on and so on and so forth. I remember when I was in the fifth grade and we moved to Paxton, Illinois, my dad really had an... <laughs> 
an old preacher in the area that he really liked. My dad was in his late 30s, and that old preacher was in his early 70s, you know, and I'm calling him old now. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, this old man, as I saw him as a fifth grader, would come to our church. My dad would always call on him to pray. And he was one of these guys who prayed around the world. And back in those days, if you were called on to pray, you always walked to the front. And you stood up in front when you prayed. And uh, this was in a revival meeting. And, and churches were filled in revival meetings back then because they didn't have any place else to go. There was nothing to do. They didn't have TVs at home. It was as much a social event as it was a religious event. And so a church building would be packed. And the evangelist, we happened to be right across the street from the school. And, and so the evangelist's wife would have a class right after school. We'd go over there. And we'd learn scripture verses and songs and so forth. Then you come to the revival meeting that night and you sit in the first two rows. And during the song service, they'd have you stand up and do what you were supposed to do. Well, this particular night, Mickey Henson, the chief of police son, sat there. I sat there and Chuck Werner sat there. And Chuck was one of these guys who you never knew what he was going to do next or how. And Mickey was right close behind him. I was the only one of the three that ever behaved himself. And... <clears throat> <laughs> And my dad, it came prayer time, and my dad called this guy to come down in front and pray. So he came down in front, wearing his suit and tie, very dignified, and he stood right here, and here we are, sitting right there. And he prayed, 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 and he, prayed, and he cut, you know, it's like it's never going to quit. Finally, he quits. There's total silence, of course, and Mickey goes, Whoosh! And got just what you just did. I mean, the whole place just busted out laughing, and he might as well have not prayed at all. Now, I don't think this was the intent of his heart. But the fact of the matter is, I think there's been sometimes that thought, well, you know, if I pray, I'll, I'll have something real short, because I don't know how to pray long, so that, that's not going to be a good prayer. We need to understand, words don't make the prayer. We use words... But it's the attitude behind it that determines whether or not it is a prayer according to the will of God. Well, what are those attitudes? That's what we want to look at this hour. What are the attitudes I need to have that will make it a prayer that is according to the will of God whenever I pray? And the first one, my prayer is validated by the attitude in which I accept the answer. And that is an attitude of submission. The attitude in which I accept God's answer needs to be an attitude of submission if it's going to be a prayer according to God's will. Now, let me define submission as we're using it here tonight. And it's got three parts to it. First of all, I believe God will always do what is best. That's the foundation. No matter what the answer is, I believe God will do what is best. Secondly, so I am always willing to accept what He does. And sometimes that's not easy, and I'll tell you a little story about that in just a few minutes. I believe God will always do what is best, and so I'm always willing to accept what He does. Now it's this next one that makes it submission. Even when it is not what I want or expect. I believe God will always do what is best, so I am always willing to accept what He does, even when it is not what I want or accept now or expect. Now, think about this for a minute. If it is what you want and you expect, and you are looking forward to that, and you're happy with it, it doesn't require any submission. Submission only comes into play no matter where it is. When you're being asked to do something you don't want to do. Submission is used several times in the Scripture. We run into it, though we may not use the exact word, we run into the concept 
out there in the world. And it's always the matter of I'm being asked to do something I don't want to do. Now comes the question, am I submissive or not? And when I come to God in prayer, I come with an attitude that I, I know I can count on God to always do what's best. He'll always do it the right thing. And so I'm always willing to accept what He does. Even what He does is not what I wanted to happen. I still accept it. Now, there are two situations in which a submissive attitude is needed. And it's very simple and very obvious. The first is when we don't know the will of God, and the other is when we do know the will of God. But it's a little bit of a different situation. Let's take the first one, submission, when we do not know the will of God. We've got an example of it back in the book of Daniel. In the third chapter, with three guys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you may remember, yesterday I spoke of Daniel, and I said he had optimistic faith because he told King Nebuchadnezzar, I'll tell you what your dream was and what it means, and he didn't have a thing in the world to base it on, except he just had had enough experience with God, he believed he could count on God to do it. And that was optimistic faith. And he went back and he asked three guys to join him in prayer. And these were the three. So I don't know what they were before that time, but if they weren't before that time, at that time, they obviously became believers in optimistic faith because of what they did. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, they say. They were told they had to bow down and worship that idol. We don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. We're not accountable to you. We're accountable to God. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us, okay? Nobody can argue that point that understands God. God had the ability and the power to save them. So far, so good. And then they add this. And He will rescue us from your hand. Oh, yeah? Where'd you get that idea? Well, I know where they didn't get it, based on what we find in the Scripture. They didn't get it from God. They're like Daniel. Daniel didn't tell Nebuchadnezzar, I'll tell you what your dream was, because he got that message from God. No. He had optimistic faith in God, that he could trust God, he could believe in God, and God would take care of the situation. They're walking that same path. Because there's not any indication whatsoever here that God would save them from that fire. But they absolutely plainly state, He will rescue us from your hand, O King. That's what they believed, even though it wasn't promised to them ahead of time. Then they added this. But even if He does not, so now they admit that they don't have a word from God on it. This is their own complete trust in God, and they could be wrong. God may not have the same thing in mind that they do. So it's a possibility He may not save us. And we want you, King, to understand something. If that happens, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. We are submitting to God. And we believe God will do this. And we want God to do this. But if God does not do that, it isn't going to change one thing in our commitment to Him. We will not bow. We will not worship. We'll stand tall and strong for God. We will submit totally to what he says needs to be done. Now you say, okay, but let me tell you why it's such a big deal. Because maybe you've experienced this personally. If you've been in the church long, you've seen it. And it's this. You, your family, or somebody has got 
total faith about a situation, and you believe God's going to make it end this way, and you pray, and you tell people. And this tends to happen most often regarding health issues in our particular church culture. People are absolutely 100% sure Grandpa had a heart attack, but God's going to give him the power and bring him back. And they spread that word. We're not, we're not concerned. God's going to heal him. He'll be up and walking again one of these days. Now, is there anything wrong with taking that position? Not at all. If it's genuine, if you genuinely have that kind of faith in God, an optimistic faith, based on everything you see in the past, and you've experienced in the past, you believe God is going to bring that person back, and you want to hang on to that belief and trust it, and that's what you're building on, and that's what you're praying on, and that's the confidence you have when you pray. That's what they had. Nothing wrong with that. So long as you stick in the next phrase. If I'm wrong and God doesn't do what I'm sure He's going to do. Because the bottom line is I can't turn any place in the Bible and find a line that says that's what He's going to do. So if it turns out I'm wrong and He doesn't do it, then what? Well, here's the what that we've seen. We've seen people who we thought were very strong Christians just start cooling off. And sometimes it takes a few weeks and sometimes it takes a few months or a year. But from that day on, they're never as enthused in their commitment to Christ as they once were. And if they open up to somebody clear over here, they'll say it. Well, I prayed to God that this would happen and I was sure it would and it didn't. And God let me down. And the fact of the matter is you didn't have anything to base it on except your faith to start out with, which is not bad. We've seen people just almost instantaneously stop going to church and drop any attention to the things of God after that. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and God knew that I was trusting Him and I believed Him and we lived for Him and it didn't happen and that's the way it's going to be, I'm done. This is why I include this emphasis in this seminar. Not to say you should never feel that way, but to say, always be sure you add the next phrase. No matter how much confidence I have and no matter how much trust I have, I always need to add the next phrase like they did. But if God doesn't do it, it's not going to change my commitment to God one bit. You see, that's submission. When what God does isn't what you wanted done, or what God doesn't do isn't what you wanted. These men knew what God was capable of doing, and we've all experienced that. We know what God's capable of doing in a situation. But they didn't really know what God would do. It wasn't like we talked about last night. They couldn't turn to a promise and put their finger on it and say, here, God promised this so I can count on that. They had no assurance about what God would do because there was no promise. They expected that He would do what was best because He always did, and they were willing to accept that. And what happened? Well, in this case, the result was God bestowed upon them that very special blessing and gave them exactly what they were trusting Him to do. And so here we have a very good illustration of being submitted when we don't really know what God's will is. And submission says, I'll take whatever God does, even if it's not what I want or what I expect it. Because I know God always does what's best. I trust Him completely. And so even if He doesn't do what I want Him to do, I'll accept it. That's submission when you don't know. Now, the flip side, obviously, is submission when you do know. And the immediate response might be, well, hey, that'll be easy. <laughs> I do know what He wants done, 
and so I'll do it. Well, let me give you the prime illustration of this from God's Word that shows it's not easy. Matthew 26, verse 39. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground, and he prayed, My Father, if it is possible. Notice that. Think about that for a minute. This is Jesus saying, If it is possible. May this cup be taken from me. I want this cup taken from me. And then notice what he says next. Yet not as I will, but as you will. We have this picture of Jesus because of what we read in all the rest of the Gospels, especially John, where he talks about being one with the Father, and he and the Father, and the Father in him, and him doing what the Father wants him to do because he loves the Father, and etc. So we have this picture that absolutely every time Jesus ever faced a situation, he was always instantaneously, okay, I'll do what you want me to do. Just do it. And he never had any feelings opposed to what God was going to do. But here we have a completely different picture. There's only one way you can understand what he says. Not as I will, but as you will. There's only one way to understand that statement. He wanted one thing and he knew God wanted something different. Now the issue of submission comes into play. Well, what was it he wanted different? Well, a lot of times people say what he wanted was to avoid the crucifixion. But I don't think that was it at all. Uh, not that a crucifixion is easy to take just because it's common. <laughs> but there were hundreds of people being crucified by the Romans back then. And so to be trying to ask God, don't have me crucified, would be an unusual request in that environment. Uh, <clears throat> it's much deeper than that. And I think we need to illustrate it this way by getting away from it for a minute. And just picture this. We've got this thousand gallon tank of absolutely 100% pure water right here. Over here I've got a test tube <laughs> with a tenth of an ounce of any kind of an impure liquid. A tenth of an ounce against a thousand gallons. I bring this across the way and dump that tenth of an ounce in a thousand gallons and immediately a thousands of gallons of water are no longer pure. They lose their purity with just one tenth of an ounce of impurity. Okay, what is God? Two outstanding things we find in the scripture about God. I am holy. And God is love. Let's look at the holy. What's that mean? Holy at its most fundamental core meaning of the word just means separated. That's it. Completely separated from something else in some way. And we've got a very good illustration right here with us tonight. You look around at all these chairs and they're identical. But when you look at this one, it's separated from all of those because it's different. It's not the same in several ways. And technically, staying just to the technical meaning of the word, we could say that's a holy chair. See, that's why God is holy, because He's totally separated from everything. Talk about power, talk about knowledge, talk about wisdom, anything. He is totally separated and completely pure in every way. Now, what happens when Jesus goes to the cross? Peter says that Jesus bore, and he's specific about this, in his body. We always picture this figuratively. You know, Christ went and died at Calvary for my sins. He bore my sins. But 
Peter brings the body of Jesus into the picture. And I think it was to help us really understand the degree to which Jesus bore our sins. He was personally carrying my sins on him at Calvary. Your sins on him at Calvary. All of our sins. Everybody out there in the world. One night I was teaching this. At this point, something struck me. When Jesus was on the cross, he was the biggest sinner that ever walked the face of the earth. Because he had every sin anybody's ever committed upon him that night. Everybody's sin. Peter says, he bore our sins in his body. Okay, what's that mean? What that means is very simple. He can't have any connection with God. Because God is perfectly holy. And God can't connect with one-tenth of one sin. Because if he did, he'd lose his holiness. And so here's what we have. For the very first time in all of their existence, Jesus was going to be separated from his Father. He hung on the cross and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We're in a position where we can stand, we have seen people stand out at the airport back during days when our soldiers were involved in fighting. And uh, <clears throat> we've seen families out there when a son or a daughter or father or mother, or brother, or sister is leaving here and going to Afghanistan or wherever. And everybody there knew this could be the very last time you ever see them alive. And we've watched the emotion of that. Now, here's the interesting thing. I can absolutely guarantee you, I don't care who the family was. Absolutely every family out there. No matter who they were wrapping their arms around that was leaving and hugging and crying and telling them how much they loved them, I can absolutely guarantee you there was some time in their history when those two people didn't want to be in the same room with each other. They had had experiences when they didn't feel that way about each other. I remember one, one parent saying to me, their, their child kept telling him he's going to leave home when he was 18. They said, I can hardly wait for him to get to be 18. <laughs> yeah, okay. God and Jesus never had that. If this is what happens when human beings who love one another deeply are separated, can you imagine what that meant to Jesus when he saw that coming down the road? It wasn't the crucifixion he wanted to avoid. It was that being forsaken because of the sin he was going to be carrying. How strong was that impact on him? Well, here's what it says in Matthew. He was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. You realize what that's saying? He was so sorrowful in the Garden of Gethsemane that he nearly died there. We've all probably had an experience from the loss of somebody or some situation where we have just been overwhelmed by negative feelings and sorrow and, you know, we thought, am I going to make it through this? But here it was such a unique situation that he sweat, as it were, drops of blood. Uh, <clears throat> we had a doctor at Georgetown. One Sunday he came into me and he had a stack of papers all bound together and it was about maybe not quite a half inch thick, maybe a third of an inch thick. He said, I thought you might like to see this, Jerry. And I said, what is it? And he said, well, I got a couple of doctor friends who are Christians. And he said, they decided they wanted to research what happened to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, where it talks about him shedding blood. And they wanted to see if there really was that kind of thing, and if so, what's involved with it. And, and so he gave me the paper to read the research that they had done. And I don't know. 60, 70 pages of it, I probably understood only about 60% of the words. But I got the point of what they were saying. And, and they started out by making this clear. They had a hard time researching it. Because this kind of thing, the idea of blood 
seeping through your skin is so extremely rare that even the medical field, there's almost nobody that knows anything about it. And so it took them quite a while to even find anything. But what they finally found was this, and there, the technical name was in there for it. I did this seminar two times ago, and there was a doctor there, and he spoke up and gave me the name, and I don't, I don't remember what it was. But uh, anyhow, you'll remember from your elementary school health class, science class, or whatever, what's the last vessel underneath your skin carrying blood? The capillaries. Well, what these doctors found is that in a particular body, when everything is just right in that specific body, extreme stress can actually cause those capillaries to start leaking blood through the skin. Well, what kind of stress did Jesus have? Sorrow unto death. We talk about a broken heart. <laughs> That's what he had. He already knew what God's plan was. He knew what God's will was. But it was not his desire to do it that way. See, I don't think Jesus was trying to get out from underneath being our Savior. I think he was saying to, to God, God, is there some way I want to do this? I'm willing to do your will, but I don't want to be separated from you. We are one. I've never had that experience. That ought to say something to us about what kind of a desire we should have in our hearts to be one with God. And he's saying... I'm willing to do what has to be done to save the world, but please, is there a different way than, I, you know, I'll go to the cross. But do I have to be separated from you? But if there's no other way, I'm submissive. I'll do it. He did want to fulfill God's will. But if possible, through a different process than what was happening and what he saw happening. Have you ever felt that way? I have. And there are probably about four or five people here that understand it. Because when we went to Christ Church of Georgetown in 1970, <clears throat> I planned to stay there for the rest of my life. And Georgetowners, you and Bartles and Dave, did you go to Georgetown? I didn't, I didn't think so. Okay. Um, you heard me say this from the pulpit several times over the years. Man, I love it here. This is a great ministry and a great church. And if you decide to fire me someday, okay. But we're not moving. We're going to stay here and go to church, so you're not going to get rid of us, so you might as well learn to love us anyhow. <laughs> I don't know if you remember hearing that or not, but I said that about every three or four years. We were going to stay there till. I was time to retire. And then one day the phone rang. And it was the chairman of the search committee for the president of Great Lakes. And he and I had been on the board of trustees together and almost never ever agreed on anything. Well, he's a nice guy. We always got along fine. It's just that when we were talking about issues, he always seemed to see it differently than I did. And he called and he says, I'm, I'm calling on behalf of the search committee. We'd like to put your name on the list. I literally broke out laughing. I started laughing. I said, Doc, I can't believe you said that. He said, well, I did, and I mean it. And I said, you know good and well, I don't want my name on that list. And he wouldn't give up. And I was on the line with him for 45 minutes. And finally, just to get him off the line, I said, okay, Don, put my name on the list with this qualification. It has to go at the bottom and if you ever get down to it, you tell the search committee he's already said he won't come, so we've got to make a new list. I went out, and I told the staff, which included Nancy Omar. Kay was not in the office at that time. Uh, Nancy Wood, and we had three associates. 
And the first reaction I got from them was group laughter. They all thought it was hilarious. Why? Well, the response from one of the area preachers up at Garrett after I ended up accepting it will tell you the whole story and just one thing. He called me up one day and I answered and, and he started laughing. He said, I can't believe you have accepted the presidency at Great Lakes. And he's laughing all the time he's saying it. I said, you can't. He said, no, you got to know something. I just got to share this with you. He said, all the preachers of the area had you tagged as being the vice president of the Grumpy Alumni Association. <laughs> because at that time, and I want to explain something. I'm not bad-mouthing Great Lakes today. This, this was 1994. So we're talking a long way back. But the bottom line was Great Lakes was going down the tubes right then. They, had, they literally came within two days of closing. And uh, they'd lost almost all the alumni support. We sent a letter out of 2,700 letters, and I got 26 responses back. And everybody was unhappy. They hadn't had a president for three years because nobody would take the job. And so I went about to leave Georgetown to go there at all. Well, I can't tell you the whole story. That was in February or March, about this time of year, when that call came from, came through. And obviously... I went home and told Pat, and she broke out laughing. Everybody we talked to about it thought it was the funniest thing they'd ever heard. And nobody thought I'd ever go, and I didn't. And we started working our way through that period of time. And, and the jaws started squeezing, and it was obvious that there was more than just something happening. I, I can't take the time to tell you, but it, they'd be illustrations. If we end up with time at the end, I'll tell you. Uh, there were things, it had to be, wow, only God could make that happen. Only God could make that happen. And 10 months later, I had reached a point back in, well, not quite 10 months, November, I reached a point where it was very obvious. God was pointing us that direction. And neither Pat nor I wanted to go. I absolutely did not want to go. I had sent a letter to the trustees and withdrawn my name. And yet knew that it wasn't the thing to do. And on a Tuesday, Pat and I were in the kitchen. I sent the letter on Monday, and I said, you know, Pat, I, I have no desire to go there, but I keep thinking that was the wrong thing to do. She said, yeah, I feel the same way. I said, well, we sent the letter. There's nothing we can do. I guess all we can do now is just pray. If God really wants us to go there, that somebody will call us and say, would you reconsider? The very next day, I got a phone call from a trustee I hadn't heard from. How you doing? Everything's fine, so on and so forth. He said, I got a question for you used the exact same words, would you reconsider? When it finally hit me, folks, that that's where God was directing me, we were in the living room of our house. I sat on the couch and cried for 30 minutes straight. That was the last thing in the world I wanted to do. I'd been in, in the administration up there clear back when I was in my 20s. I know what goes on in Bible colleges, and I don't mean that as a sour taste kind of thing. But they're not just outside heaven's gates. Let me put it that way. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, they're people. <laughs> and I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but being a college president is ranked as the second, second most difficult professional job that there is. Uh, ministry is the seventh, and I'm lucky. I've had two out of the top ten. <laughs> How about that? I sat there and I cried for 30 minutes. Pat sat there with her arm around me. And finally I stood up and I looked at her and I said, Pat, I'm not trying to f sound special or holy or saintly but you know I think for the first time in my life I've got a taste of what Jesus went through in the Garden of Gethsemane because I absolutely do not want to do this but I can't deny the fact everything's happening in a way that says that's where God wants us to go 
I want to tell you something, folks. I can tell you from experience. Being submissive to God may be a challenge when you don't really know what God wants you to do and He does something you weren't expecting. But it can be an even bigger challenge when you know what God wants you to do and you don't want to do it. And I wrap that conversation up with these words to Pat. Well, I guess this is where we find out whether or not Jesus really is the Lord of our life. And we continued through the process and three months later announced that we'd be going there. Folks, what's God's attitude when you are submissive? Well, look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. Listen to it. Jesus offered up prayers and petitions and He was heard because of His reverent submission. When you come with a submissive heart, that's going to make God want to hear you. Because you're praying according to His will. With no idea what God's will was, the three men of the Old Testament were submissive to it. Knowing full well what God's will was, Jesus was submissive to it. And if you'll be submissive when you pray, you have a spirit of submission when you pray, then you're going to experience God's faithfulness just as they did when He answers your prayer because you're praying according to His will. Let's look at the next one. The attitude in which I anticipate God's response. And that's faith. Faith. We want to look at a couple things in regard to our faith. First of all, we want to look at the object of our faith. Mark eleven twenty two through 24 starts out with a very simple four-word phrase. Have faith in God. And then he goes on to talk about not doubting, etc. That is important. Have faith in God. And you say, well, of course it's important. Yeah, but let me, let me discuss something with you. My grandmother had this on a plaque in her house as long as I could remember anything till the very day we emptied the house. I used to say this. <laughs> you probably have said it. Prayer changes things. How many of you believe prayer changes things? Yeah. Well, stop believing it. <laughs> because it's not true. Prayer doesn't change anything. How many people pray? There are all kinds of people in all kinds of religions all over. Every religion in existence on the face of the earth has something that's the equivalent of prayer for them. Prayer doesn't change anything. My computer quit working one day, and uh, I did everything I could to make it work. And I couldn't do anything to get it fixed. So I got on the phone, and I called Comcast because it seemed to be a problem there. And so the guy on the other end of the line said, well, do this, do that. I said, I've done all that. Well, let's go through it again. So I did. And he said, well, obviously that's not your problem. He said, maybe I can fix it at this end. And so he said, hang on. It'll probably be about 10 minutes before I come back. Don't think I've deserted you. Just wait. So I did. 10 minutes later, about, he came back. He said, okay, now try it. I did. Bingo. It worked. Just like that. I have no idea what he did at that end. But whatever he did, it suddenly solved the whole problem and it worked. Now I want to tell you something. I didn't go trotting down the stairway and say to my wife, Pat, computers change things. I went down and said, there's some guy out there somewhere that did something that made it work. Prayer doesn't change anything at all. God changes things. God changes things. Don't ever say prayer changes things. And here's why. Here's what it does. It makes people think just because they prayed about something, it's going to change. And they may not know beans about prayer. They, they may not even come close to what we find as prayer in the Bible. But they think, I prayed about it, so it's going to be okay. And unfortunately, sometimes we as Christians feel that way. We pray about it, so that's going to make it okay. God didn't say have faith in prayer. Not at all. He said, or Jesus didn't say it. He said have faith in God. Have faith in God. 
We please God by making Him the object of our faith, not our prayers. Not our spiritual track record. Well, hey, I'm a pretty good Christian. I'm in church all the time. I serve in a good office in the church. And they can always count on me and I read my Bible, etc. He, he didn't say have faith in your understanding of the Scripture. The better you understand the Scripture, the more likely God is to answer your prayers. Now, he didn't say that. He said have faith in God. That's to be the object of our prayers, or of our of our faith. God. And the nature of it, Hebrews 11 says, without faith it's impossible to please God because A, anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists. Well, everybody here believes that, I'm sure. And B, that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Now here's where the question comes in. Remember what I said yesterday morning? 85% of people who pray regularly have said they, expect, they want God to answer their prayer. They hope God will answer their prayer. But they don't expect God to answer their prayer. That's exactly what this is talking about. Faith includes not just believing there's a God, but believing when I pray He will hear and answer my prayer. That should be the nature of my faith. The basis for my faith, Solomon said, not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave. The basis is the Word of God. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will never pass away. The dependable Word of God is the basis of my faith. I'm reminded of the unwavering total dependability of God's Word. You know, <laughs> I'm glad I've gotten to live this long. I've told the guys down at this college this many times because there's been an awful lot happening in the last 10, 15 years of my life spiritually. The longer you live, the higher up the mountain you go and the more you can see. And so it makes it much easier to begin to put things together that you weren't able to put together down the, when you're still down, down and closer to the valley. And this is one of them. The absolute total dependability of the Word of God, even when what I'm reading doesn't make sense in the situations that I'm in. The basis of my faith is simply knowing what God has said He will do. Because if God said He will do it, He will do it. So believe God. When you read something in the Word and it connects with what you're involved in in your life and it, somehow you read that and you say, no, that doesn't make sense. Believe it. Trust God and believe it. Let that be the foundation. And just say to God, God, <laughs> I'm having a hard time believing this. And the situation I'm in, I don't see how that can be true. But you said it, so I believe it. And move on and build from that. Let's give some illustrations. Praying about our needs. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I told you last night about it. In, in our own life, in the first ministry we had. Much more recently, we had an interesting thing happen. Years back. We opened up our mail one day and there was a check from $700. And there was just a note with it. It said, God has blessed us and we decided to share it with some people. This is for you. And we were stunned. <laughs> Got a check for $700. And the next week, I had a car problem and it cost $700. <laughs> God was taking care of my need before it even happened. You can trust God's Word. Praying about unwholesome talk. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And this unwholesome talk doesn't have to be vulgar talk or anything like that. It can be a, a critical kind of talk 
uh, tearing people down, uh, chewing people out, whatever. Well, guess what? I had a guy tell me one time, I can't help it, that's just me. <laughs> My dad was that way and I was born that way and that's just the way people are going to have to accept it. And I looked at him and I said, no, nobody has to accept it. That's what being a Christian is all about. God gives you the power to deal with it. How do I know that? Well, here, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and guess what? Self-control. I can control that unwholesome talk through the power of the Holy Spirit. I can't do it on my own. I've tried all my life, we can say. But when the power of the Holy Spirit is released in my life, just take God's Word for it. God said, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can have the self-control you need. And so do it exactly that way. Simply say to God, I'm not able to do this. In this situation, I need self-control. And Holy Spirit, help me get out of the way. And you get in there and you produce the fruit of self-control. And you'll be stunned at what happens sometimes. And then praying for wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it'll be given to him. You know when an attorney picks up his appointment book and he sees he's got somebody coming in at 2 o'clock? He knows something before they even get there. He's never met this person. But he knows they're coming to talk to him about a legal matter. A doctor picks up his appointment pad and somebody's coming in to see him at 10.30, and he knows something. Never seen him before, but he knows they're coming in to talk to him about a physical matter. Secretary's made an appointment. The preacher picks up the book and looks at it. And he's got an appointment at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You know what? He hadn't the foggiest notion why they're coming in. Not at all. And you can't believe some of the things every preacher, wherever I've been, you've got preachers, they're shaking their head. You can't believe what people go to their preachers about sometimes. After what I told you last night, you'll understand why this is funny. I had a very quiet woman who just didn't relate openly to much of anybody. And, but as her preacher, she had come to trust me, and she came in to talk to me about how she needed to go about repairing her car. Well, the first thing you do is put the key in the ignition. <laughs> That's about all I could tell her. I had somebody come in and to talk to me about how to treat their dog that was sick. I said, have you thought about calling a vet? Well, yeah, but you've had dogs I thought you might know. <laughs> and the result of that was many, many years ago, and I wish I could say every time I've done this, but I haven't. Many, many years ago, I learned that verse of Scripture, and when I knew somebody was coming in and I didn't have any idea why, I'd pray that. God, you have said you will give me wisdom. Okay, I don't know why they're coming. I don't know what they're going to throw out on my desk. Just give me the wisdom to handle with the very best way that you want it handled. And I can tell you time and time again that has happened. When I went to Great Lakes, I wrote that out on a card and I put it on my desk and it was there for five years. The first student that came in to talk to me, came in to inform me he was going to sue, he had already talked to an attorney about suing the school. I'd never had that happen before. The first week, about the third or fourth phone call I got was from New York City. Somebody the school owed several thousands of dollars to, and the second phone call that came right after it that day was from somebody in Lansing where we owed $5,000. I never had to deal with that kind of stuff before. The last week we were in the office building somebody from this church came in and they set the appointment up they called and set up the appointment and Beth you worked in the office you might have even scheduled this appointment for me I don't know I had no idea why they were coming it just didn't make sense because I knew this individual was a pretty smart individual so why would they come to me so they came in to talk to me about a problem they were having in the business world. Well, granted, five years at Great Lakes put me into the business world, so I had some experience there, but I didn't, this individual, like 
you people have spent his whole life in the business world. And he just simply said to me, Jerry, I'm confronting something I've never had to deal with before in my life. And I don't know what to do. I thought maybe you could help me. So he told me. And I looked at him and I said, I've never heard anything like that either. I don't have any idea. I, I left an important thing out. I read that verse and prayed that prayer before he came in because it just didn't make sense that he was coming. He, he said he was coming in to get my advice on something. And so I read that and prayed that prayer. And after he laid it out, I said, I never heard of anything like that before in my life. He said, neither have I. And I've been trying to deal with it for quite some time. I don't know what to do. I said, well, let's just talk. About 25 minutes later, all of a sudden, an idea popped into my head. And I said, hey, how about this? Do you think this would work? And I no more got it out of my mouth. And he said, that is it. That is exactly what I've needed. That'll work. And with that, he got up and he walked out. And I sat there in my desk and I went, you're a pretty smart guy. For about 10 seconds. I won't deny I did feel that way immediately. But it only lasted about 10 seconds. And I said to myself, you know what? God keeps his word. He said he'd give you wisdom. Trust God's word. Believe God. When I come before God with a faith in Him and I believe He'll give me what, I, what He has promised to me, I'm honoring the integrity of His Word and I'm giving Him the opportunity to show the whole world that He is faithful to God. I'm going to wrap up this third point real quick because I think it's an easy point for all of you to grasp who are here tonight. The final point is the attitude in which I approach God, and that is an attitude of confidence. Three times in, in the New Testament we have that word used. Hebrews 4 says, let us then approach the throne of grace, God's throne, how? With confidence. That in itself is just a very unique idea. Me, a sinful human being, can go before God and go with confidence. Why? so that I might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need, which pretty well describes what we're doing when we pray, isn't it? First John, we read it, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask, he says in the third chapter, and then the fifth chapter we've been using. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. But many Christians don't come before God with confidence. They pray with uncertainty. Their whole connection with God is sort of a wavery one. No confidence. Well, if that's been true in your life, let me show you why you can have confidence. In the first place, you are relying upon the perfect representative. Jesus. Jesus Christ. Why is He the perfect representative? Because He has direct contact with God. Ephesians, God raised him, Jesus, from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Jesus is right there next to God. He has direct contact with God. Secondly, he has God's approval. At both his baptism and at the transfiguration, God said, This is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. What a tremendous confidence we can have when we know our spokesman is one about whom God has already said, I'm happy with him. I like him. I'm pleased with him. God approves of him. And he's my spokesman. And then he understands me and he understands my needs. That's part of the reason he came to this world. We don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are. But he was without sin. Jesus understands God's expectations. He's already received the highest words of praise from God 
And he understands our situation. You don't face anything in life that he hasn't already faced to. Now, you may be tempted to drive 80 miles an hour in a 65 mile an hour speed zone when he wanted a donkey to go faster. But I don't care what has, happens to you in life, you scrape off all of the top surface things that make us live and get right down to the in the heart kinds of things. And everything you've ever faced or will face, Jesus has faced. And by the way, again, one night when I was teaching this, all of a sudden it dawned on me, that's exactly why he had to go through what he did in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, it's one of the reasons. Think about that. If Jesus had never gone through a situation where he wanted to do this, and he knew God wanted him to do this, then he couldn't have related to us when we're in that situation. But he got into that situation at the most crucial moment of his life, the most significant decision of his life, and so Jesus understood everything I was going through in making the decision to leave Georgetown and go up there. Jesus understands every time you read in here, this is what you're supposed to do to please God. This is how God says you'll have the best life. And you look at that and you struggle with it because you want to do something different. Jesus knows what that feeling is. So, you have a special relationship as a child of God. Think about that. I got a whole sermon in which I, I build around that one. I think about what it means to be a child of God. To those who believe in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. I am a child of God. A child. I didn't receive a spirit that makes me a slave again to fear, but I received the spirit of sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba. Father. And you've probably heard it explained a hundred times that the word Abba is just another way of which they said Daddy. Daddy, Father. One of the young men that we baptized over at Georgetown goes to Broadway now. Uh, he was a musician in Chet Chambers' band. And uh, I came back to Fort Wayne, got him on Facebook when I got on Facebook. I'll admit, the very first time I saw it, I was stunned and I, I really reacted negative to it. Every time he speaks of God, he calls him Daddy God. And the first time it just kind of, Daddy God. And then I got to thinking, well, that's exactly what Paul said in Romans. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But when you pray, you're going to your daddy and crawling up on his lap and saying, I need to talk to you. Now, if you had, and I know all homes didn't have this, but if you had a good father in your home, you know what that's like. Go to your dad and say, I need to talk to you. You're not a nobody. When you approach God, you're a child of God. You can crawl up in his lap and you can spill out your heart. I mean, David... He crawled up in his lap sometimes. He said, I don't understand what you're doing. It doesn't make any sense to me. And quite frankly, I'm a little upset with you. But isn't that what you do with your father? If you've got that kind of a relationship, you can be open with him. And he's still going to love you. And if anything, he's going to go out of his way to help you see his love even more. And then finally, I've determined the will of God. We've already gone through that part, so we don't need to go through it again. So, the next time you pray, check your attitude. Pray with an attitude of submission. Be ready to accept God's answer, whatever it is. Pray with an attitude of faith. Put your faith in God. Trust His Word completely. And know He will do what He said He'll do. And then pray with an attitude of confidence because you have a perfect representative. You're a child of God and you've taken time to carefully determine the will of God. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to look at those eight things that can go on in somebody's life, any one of them, and if it is going on, it's going to have a negative impact on their prayer life. Take a break. <laughs> 